Good morning, everyone. So once again, and for those of you who have just arrived, welcome. This is Visioning the Future Artistic Research Doctorates in Ireland. And this is our seminar series. And we're delighted this morning to have a really interesting group of people to talk specifically about funding the artistic research doctorates or funding the doctoral programme. So I just want to say before that, that our postponed seminar um, on uh, PhD examination is now going to be next Tuesday, the 15th of September. And we're delighted to have uh, Yvon Bonenfant, Helen Phelan and Vida Migelo, who will be joining us for that, se that session. So do join us for that and you can register on our website. So before we start today um, on our focus on uh, PhD funding, I just want to say that there are um, other forms of funding within Ireland, within each of the universities and some of the third level organizations. But at the moment, it's not easy for students to find out about that information in a general way. It's each of the institutions that have that information. So this research project, we hope to be able to bring some of that information to a central place. So it's more easy for um, PhD students or potential PhD students to see that funding. So this morning we're specifically looking at funding from the Irish Research Council and we have three representatives um, this morning. Um, first of all we have um, Dr Evan O'Brien who is from the Irish Research Council. We're delighted that Evan can join us today. She is the Assistant Director of the Irish Research Council and she's been involved with the Irish Research Council uh, since 2013 and she's also worked with the HEA. So thank you Evan, we're delighted to have you this morning. We also have um, two people who are really interesting in the way they contrast and are similar. Um, the first of these is Fergus O'Cahor, who are delighted to join us today. Fergus is a choreographer, a dance artist and an artistic director. In his own words, he um, frequently collaborates with artists and experts from other disciplines. He is a champion for what dance can help us understand about how we live in the world. His film and live performances presented around the world create frameworks for audiences and artists to build communities together. So I've known Fergus for most of the time that I've been in Ireland and I'm delighted he can join us today. He was the first Ireland Fellow on the CLAW Leadership Programme. From 2018 to 2020, he was the Artistic Director of the National Dance Company of Wales. And Fergus was appointed to the Arts Council of Ireland in 2018 and was appointed as Deputy Chair of the Arts Council in 2019. He read English and European languages at Oxford before training at London Contemporary Dance School. He completed his PhD through geography um, in, the, in NUI Maynooth, which is the National University of Ireland for those of you who are not in Ireland, in 2017 with a thesis called Artist Stroke Citizen, Choreographing the Nation Brand. So what's important about this PhD, and we'll discuss that, this this morning, is that this was not an artistic research PhD, but a more traditionally fully uh, thesis-based uh, doctorate. This was funded um, by um, an IRC, an Irish, Re Irish, Irish Research Council employment-based scholarship. So Fergus is with us today to discuss, um, in, to dis discuss PhD funding in Ireland in a personal capacity and not as a representative of the Arts Council. We also have with us today Lisa McLaughlin. I'm also delighted to have Lisa here today. Lisa is also a dance artist, a choreographer and a dancer. She trained at the Rambert School of Ballet and Contemporary Dance in London and has been an active member of the dance community in Ireland and internationally for over 20 years. She is a passionate advocate for dance and its development through pedagogy and performance. She's a lecturer and researcher in dance at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick and holds a first class MA thesis in dance, combining dance and psychology. Now, Lisa recently submitted her thesis for an arts practice PhD at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance in Limerick um, with the support of a postgraduate scholarship from the IRC. So this was um, an artistic research doctorate and this was research which focused on the, the role of autonomy in arts practice as a way to discuss complex issues. And um, Lisa is the very new head of dance at the Arts Council. In fact, she only started this week. So wishing her many congratulations. But just like Fergus, she's here as an individual rather than as a representative of the Arts Council. So I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. And I'm going to ask um, Evan O'Brien from the Irish Research Council to start just to give us an overview of the range of fundings available uh, for artistic and, and other kinds of uh, PhD programmes. Thank you, Evan. Great. Thank you so much, Jules. Um, thank you for 
to everyone for joining us and it's really great to have Fergus and Lisa here too because I know I'm looking forward to hearing about their personal experiences as well with having our funding. Um, so I'll just tell you a bit about the IRC to start with. Um, the Irish Research Council is unique in the sense that it funds all disciplines including artistic research of course and it funds all career stages but a large part of what we do is funding early career researchers and we view that development of talent and skills um, for Ireland, for the world, is hugely important. So we have a couple of different programmes that may be of interest to people. I know there are national and international people on this, this webinar, so it may be more familiar to others than, than some. So forgive me if I'm telling you things you already know. So there are three main programmes of interest, really. Probably the best known is our Government of Ireland Postgraduate Scholarship Programme which is traditional in the sense that the, the applicant works with an academic supervisor at their host institution in Ireland. So the applicant has that relationship and they, um, they either do a thesis or it can be a, an artistic doctorate, um, such as the topic today. Um, the other two programmes are a little more unusual, but they can work very well um, and they can be certainly made work in this context also. So these are the employment based program and the enterprise partnership scheme. Um, they're very similar to one another, but there are some slight nuances that I'll try to explain as well. So what's in common between the enterprise partnership scheme and the employment based program is that there's kind of there's an extra party or an extra partner in the research. So as well as there being the, um, the doctoral student and the academic supervisor, there's also an enterprise or employment partner. And that term, I think, can put a lot of people off, and rightly so, because enterprise makes people think of uh, big business industry and so on. But actually, our definition of enterprise or employment partner is actually very broad. And it, it includes not-for-profits, um, charities, it includes cultural organizations, um, such as that which, which Fergus worked with. So it gives an opportunity, I think, for an, a, an applicant to work closely with um, an academic, but then also have that broader exposure as well. Um, so just to describe very briefly the differences between those programs, it's really a matter of um, emphasis. So the enterprise partnership scheme, the applicant and successful awardee is based primarily at an academic institution with perhaps a placement at that cultural organization or whatever that may be. Um, but then in the case of the employment based program, as the name suggests, they're actually employed by that organization, such as the cultural organization, and that's where they're based primarily. So they have that chance to be really embedded in such an organization, but then equally they still have an academic supervisor who would advise them throughout. So those are the three, three main schemes. Um, probably the one that has caught people's eye most in the past is the Government of Ireland scheme, but I would suggest considering all three depending on the nature of the research that you, you have in mind, because all three have, have great benefits, I would suggest. Um, something that all of these schemes have in common and is really quite common throughout IRC programs is that they are they're bottom up, as we would say, they're led by the applicant. Um, and that's something that we've defended really from day one, that the applicant comes up with their own idea and the award is held ultimately in their name. So you may come across um, research grants that other people have out there, which are typically actually achieved or acquired by the PI, by the senior individual. Well, in this case, um, these awards are held by the doctoral student. And I think that's it's a great sign for people's future careers that they're able to get that grant in their own name at a very early stage. Um, and it's really, it's quite like, for example, the European Research Council, which people do at a much more senior level. Again, they get the grant in their own name. So um, very often you'll see that people have got one of our awards early in their careers and it gave them their, their start in what, whatever their career ultimately entails. Um, just to note, um, I'm happy to give advice, some, some kind of general tips on, on these programs and so on later on. Um, they are very competitive, so I think the fact that Lisa and Fergus were successful is, is a huge sign of their abilities. They're extremely competitive programs. Um, the success rate over the last five years for the Government of Ireland post-grad scheme is about 18%. So it's, it's tough, tough to get, and 
certainly the people who are awarded that funding are, are truly exceptional. So it's, um, it's, it's a real standard, I think, and something to be very proud of for those who achieve it. Um, something I could talk about, um, but do stop me if I'm rattling on too long, is the assessment process. Um, so this is something that um, will differ slightly with each programme, but I'll, talk, I'll focus on the Government of Ireland scheme and it's, it's largely the same with other programmes. So I guess tip number one, which is really obvious, is to, to familiarise yourselves very closely with the terms and conditions and any other documentation that's on the website, like the guide for applicants, um, to ensure that you're eligible, to ensure you've understood fully all of the different aspects of the, the relevant scheme. Um, because the first thing we do when an application is received is we check for eligibility. So there would be a small number every year who don't meet eligibility criteria, so they don't proceed to be assessed. So checking your eligibility is, is really quite key because um, unfortunately it's a desperate waste of a person's time if they turn out not to be eligible. So getting across that first hurdle is, is challenge number one. Um, and then after that, we proceed to the assessment stage. Um, just to note all of those three schemes, they're all internationally assessed. Um, we, they're not assessed by people in Ireland, they're all assessed internationally and um, people have to identify if they have any conflict of interest. So it's all done in that manner. Um, it's also anonymized, gender blinded. So the assessors won't be able to identify who you are. Um, so those applications go out to assessment. We call this outer board. It goes to, these are basically remote distance um, peer, peer reviewers who review your application. They submit their scores to us and we then essentially do a big ranking of all of the scores uh, received averaging because there are two assessors per application so we average them. And at that stage typically the lower ranking applications, so they may still be very good, they're knocked out of the process and the stronger applications proceed to stage two which we call inner board and um, they're assessed afresh by assessors, again, anonymized, gender blinded, conflicts of interest checked, and those inner board assessors assess the applications. Um, they do have access to the outer board um, reviews, so they can have that as an input, but they assess independently also. And then ultimately that leads to, ordinarily pre-COVID, a meeting in Dublin that we did it remotely this year, and um, that meeting leads to the assessors at the inner board agreeing their scores, agreeing a final ranking, and then the top applicants are made offers of award. Um, and then typically we would always have a reserve list of candidates as well, because there are always awards that are declined. There's always the small chance of additional funding becoming available. So we keep that reserve list to, to activate if we can. So that's that's basically the gist of how the process works. Happy to take questions. If I can answer them, I certainly will. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Evan. I really appreciate that. So um, we will take questions. We're going to have a small discussion between um, the three and the four of us first, and then we'll open for questions. So do please um, put your questions in the Q&A tab. There are two tabs, the chat and the Q&A. If you put them in the Q&A, that would be helpful. Um, and but you can put them in the chat. We'll, we'll find them there as well. Thank you. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is bring in Fergus O'Cahor. Um, Fergus, I'm really interested um, if you could tell us a little bit about your own experience and um, the, um, the employment-based scheme that you um, were received and how that worked and how that facilitated your doctoral research. Thanks. Um, well, good morning, Dith Mariv Gachanya. Um, I'm actually just managing the sort of nervousness um, of having heard Ivan describe the um, assessment process and somehow feeling like I mightn't get through. Um, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad I didn't know about the process when I was applying. It's, it's quite terrifying. So I'm sorry to start with that for all of you who are kind of prospective um, funding applicants. But um, so to say, um, yes, I applied to the to the kind of very first iteration of the employment-based uh, PhD. And actually, it's interesting to hear Ivan talk about it now because I think there's a kind of clarity, um, you know, since 2013, that was when I applied, about what the scheme is. Because, of course, whenever you set up a scheme, it's got to kind of work itself out. And at the time, when I saw the opportunity, I think I've always been someone who is happy to hack um, a structure 
to kind of make opportunities um, and sometimes for artistic practice that's what you need to do and when I saw the employment-based PhD opportunity it looked like something I needed to hack because it at the time I didn't think it looked like it was it seemed like it was suitable for maybe someone who was uh, doing research in a in a kind of tech laboratory that could have you know that could be kind of producing um uh, you know new developments with the support of a of a university supervisor but kind of very much within a that kind of enterprise environment um and i thought well i we can do something with this um and i have to say it wouldn't have been possible um certainly in that employment based situation without champions in each of so both in the university um I was supervised by Professor Jerry Cairns and uh, also with a lot of support by Karen Till, Professor Karen Till, both at Maynooth, who had both been interested in art and geography. And so I'd, I had sort of met them as geographers who were interested in artistic practice in Ireland. And so I knew that they were, they knew about my work as a choreographer. So, you know, I, at that time in 2013, I was in my late 40s. Um, uh, someone who had a, a kind of career as a dance artist and as a choreographer in Ireland, but their knowledge of my work and kind of sympathy towards it meant that I had champions within the university and that felt important. To, to have a champion within the university was important. Um, the other employment-based partner, the employment partner was um, Project Art Centre, which is a contemporary arts venue, um, kind of one of the most important in the country and certainly um, I had worked with Project Art Center just as an individual artist, as a freelancer, but they supported, I was an associate artist there, so they helped produce my work. So again, there was a long relationship. Um, but what the employment-based uh, PhD opportunity did is have an opportunity for me to be resourced for four years. Like it's a, fact, it's a salary, that, that's what EBP was. And, and when you're a freelancer working precariously from project to project, that is a huge opportunity because the reflection that is enabled by a PhD situation is invaluable. Uh, hopefully it's invaluable, it's in, invaluable for the individual who's undertaking it, but of course, hopefully it's also going to be inv invaluable to a whole set of people who are going to be able to draw on and use that research when it when it kind of becomes public. And indeed, not only when it's finished, because what, what the, that PhD and that relationship did is um, through me, but kind of then beyond me, set up relationships between Project Art Center and Maynooth, between setting up these other kinds of connections that allowed knowledge transfer to happen between the university and this kind of cultural, important cultural institution, and then through them to a whole set of other people. So I think that's, the, those sort of connections are not to be underestimated. Like you said, um, I was very clear that I was not doing a practice-based PhD. Um, I had a practice, as in I'm a choreographer, and what I saw the PhD as was an opportunity to reflect, to look at my practice, and not just my practice, but look at dance in Ireland. So but really using mine and my particular experience, so a kind of situated perspective, um, to reflect on the experience of um, dance in relation to identity formation. So within geography, I use that idea of the, the nation brand, um, but really using it as a way to reflect on where dance is situated in Ireland. And then because accidentally part way through that uh, PhD process, I um, was part of the 2016 open call. I, I made a, a kind of major project for the commemoration for Art 2016. It meant that I had work which actually did become the center of reflection for the PhD. But that actually wasn't the intention when I started. That was a sort of happy accident as we went along. Um, but for me, it was important to separate the reflection from the creation in, in in my PhD, because for, for me, they are two different modes. Um, I had an academic background, I studied at Oxford, so I wasn't afraid of 
um, I, like I, I had the tools to be able to work entirely in producing a thesis, a thesis even though it was a new um, discipline in geography. So that, there was a lot of learning to do there. Um, but I think that whole thing, I guess, what are the useful things to say? That it was a worry in the beginning because it felt like it was new for everyone and it did require a little bit of, um, uh, it required champions and flexibility on everyone's side. So um, I felt, supported in the university to be able to remind the university that actually I was not supposed to be in the university all of the time because actually as an employment-based PhD student like effectively you are supposed to be in full-time employment and do a full-time PhD and um, having not mastered by location um, it, it just meant that you know and the way the university often works actually is it sends out a notice to say, oh, we'd like to gather all of the PhD students next week, next Monday. And you're like, well, that, like, that's not gonna work because I've got all these three other things that I'm doing um, you know, somewhere else because I'm working on that project. So you know, I would need time. So there was something about just learning the rhythms. But once, once we got into it, um, it, it was clear that it would work. It was just certainly that first year, there was a bit of anxiety that having hacked it, that maybe I wasn't gonna do it right and that I would let people down. And I was worried about that initially um, because I knew it was a big opportunity. Um, in, in retrospect, um, I have to say, it's been a hugely valuable um, opportunity for me on that practical level of providing for, for the four years that, that I was an employ, employment-based PhD student, I didn't worry about earning money. And it's not that I was earning a lot of money, but that it provided a threshold, which meant that I could do the PhD work, but actually, even though it was separate, it meant that I could do probably some of the best work that I've ever done um, during that time. And I, I just, yeah, that's not to be underestimated, even if it's not something that is that can be assessed, you know, and reported on for the IRC. Actually, I think it is a, a valuable outcome to think about how it resources artists, both in terms of reflection, but actually also practically to be able to contribute to both um, the academy, but then beyond. Maybe that's enough for now. And, or if you have any questions, you can ask me, but I think that's probably enough. Thank you, Fergus. That's wonderful. I'd like to um, bring in Lisa and we'll go to questions after we've heard from Lisa. Um, Lisa, you're um, much closer um, to um, having completed because you've just submitted um, mm. and you had a different form of the IRC um, funding. It would be great to hear from you um, how that funding supported you and the kind of work that you did as part of your PhD, as your PhD. Thank you. Yeah, uh, no, it's just really lovely to hear Fergus talking about his kind of having had a bit of distance from your process and figuring out what that meant. I've literally just thrown mine in three weeks ago. So I'm like, oh God. So I haven't had any processing time as yet. Um, but with the funding, I suppose I only applied for funding for my final year because uh, in my first year I had a full-time job. In my second year I was on maternity leave. Um, so the first time I could actually apply was in my third year. And um, I'm the mother of three children, which is an extremely expensive way of doing business. Um, and especially one of them being very small. Um, so really finishing my PhD was a serious concern, you know, so going back to being a freelance artist and going back to figuring out how I was going to pay for childcare um, on top of my fees, on top of all of those things that I was, you know, so um, yeah, I wrote the application in a time where <laughs> my, I was just thinking about this this morning, my daughter had scarlet fever my baby son, who was a year and a half, had the chicken pox, and I had one child who was not sick. <laughs> so um, I wrote it then. So it was also my, uh, my supervisor, who's wonderful, Jenny Roach, Dr. Jenny Roach. Um, it was her first time doing an IRC application because she was just coming back from the Australia. It was a different funding scheme there. So it was new to her. It was new to me. Um, and thankfully the, um, 
um, the research, the assistant dean of research, uh, Neve Nigaon, Dr. Neve Nigaon, had really been able to kind of help both of us kind of figure out the whole how to kind of structure it, um, and was amazing. But yeah, it was it was um, one of those moments where like if somebody had a camera watching me, so I was like you just take the two of them and just walk up and down the road for half an hour. And he's like, how long is half an hour? I was like, oh, just, just keep walking till I like wave at you. So he's there walking with the baby with the chicken pox and the girl who's kind of like a scarlet fever just getting over it. And I'm like furiously trying to get it in. But also what I hadn't realized was that because I hadn't been to any of those sessions where they tell you these things, I hadn't realized that it wasn't the same as the Arts Council where you just upload the form. I didn't realize that you had to actually have a separate online form. And there was a slight character difference in the character. So I put it in and obviously there was one word that, and so then I had to kind of rejig each one of them. So uh, it was one of those moments where I'm like, oh my God, if I get this. I have to stay, you know, I have to say, <laughs> I'll be so amazed. And then I off it went and I actually didn't make it in the first round. So I got, I think, um, yeah, I got 85 point, you know, or it was 89, uh, 85.5 or something. And the cutoff was 86. So I missed it in the first round. So there was 0. 0.5. I was like, oh, 0. 0.5. That's really unfortunate. Um, so I was delighted then in the second round that I got it. And yeah, it's made a huge difference because it's actually made, I know the, then there was a pandemic and then they were all back home anyway. And then childcare was gone. Um, but <laughs> those first few months of, and, and financially, as Fergus said, like actually not having to think about how can I afford to do this incredibly expensive thing? How can I justify my fees all the time that it's going to take and the childcare on top of this um, has been unbelievable. And also having time to just go, I have this time that is paid for and it actually changes your perspective on it. It's like, you know, this is time that I have been paid for to do. Um, and even though, you know, I finished in a pandemic between myself and my husband, you know, it was very kind of delineated. It's like, it's my time to work. I'm shutting the door and I'm just going to ignore the fact that there are all three screaming people in the next room. And then he would do the same thing for me. So it was, it kind of, it brings about a clarity, I think, um, and creates a structure for you in which to do it. So for me, it was been, it's been un invaluable. It really has. Thank you, Lisa. Um, that reminds me of how I um, made the application for this whole seminar series. <laughs> Not with three babies that are unwell, but certainly on two aeroplanes. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate that perspective because that's, um, it, it's wonderful to get that materiality of what it actually means to be doing a PhD and to be having a life. Um, so what I'm going to do, if that's all right, is I'm going to pass over to um, Inesh, who's our postdoctoral researcher, we have um, some questions, I think, or you may want to ask a question yourself, Inish, but I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. So just to remind everyone in the audience, too, if you have any questions you'd like to direct generally at the panel or someone, uh, just write them on the Q&A, and I will be fielding the questions that are coming in. Before I start with that process, I would like to put in a question for the panel, which is uh, looking at, I kind of want to unpick a little bit further, what the challenges that you felt and that perhaps Lisa, you might be able to tell us more about it, or Yvonne, perhaps you have some uh, suggestion in terms of putting in an application for an artistic research PhD when the funding structure is for many disciplines and it's mostly looking at traditional PhD thesis, 80 to 100,000 words, where you're putting in an artistic research project, which has, of course, different characteristics. So in terms of writing up the application and making your application stronger, what challenges did you find, Lisa? And for Yvonne, in terms of assessment uh, oh, of this application, um, <laughs> What, what thoughts do you have to share? So, Lisa, yeah. you'd like to start? Yeah, I mean, I think with an artistic um, an arts practice PhD, so the, um, when I look back now at my, um, my original proposal, 
you know, it didn't, it doesn't look anything like what it, what I've done. Um, and actually what I ended up doing was about 25 million times more ambitious than what I had started out with. So initially I had, I thought it was going to be much more practice based, more studio based, more, um, about me as an artist. It ended up involving 300 people. So, um, the autonomy project was, you know, um, there was actually a hundred people making work within that. Or so I had young people, I had artists, I had academics. So it became kind of a very um, robust project. Um, and then the second project, I wanted to, to reverse that. So inverse that and look at, you know, um, dependency from the perspective of a singular person. But even within that, I walked in four different um, cities with 184 people. So I ended up kind of doing an autoethnography of that, of me walking with, with these people arm in arm, which I think is, is so funny in this time of COVID. Can you imagine some stranger saying, will you walk with me arm in arm and have a chat? You know, like, I wonder, will that ever be? a possibility again you know I was like I'd be a walking one woman contagion machine you know um but in terms of like by the time I was writing the application um the, there was a lot in the research you know the the autonomy project I had done it already um I had a huge amount of data gathered so there was a kind of a a I don't know there was a robustness and I remember so my my initial um supervisor was Professor Helen Phelan. And she had said to me, you know, maybe give yourself the first year to really walk around it. Because I think when you are looking at arts practice, it's so complex. So, you know, I'd come from a um, kind of a traditional MA. And when you walk from that into arts practice and what arts practice can mean and the huge amount of, you know, um, ways that you can explore the different types of writing, you know, getting your head around autoethnography, auto, auto narrative inquiry, all the different things and different ways that you can look at something. I do think it's better or it'd be a stronger application in year two when you have your head around that. So I'm really, really glad that I actually didn't kind of barrel straight into that. Um, so I think if I was to give you any kind of advice, whether I don't know how useful advice is, it's just to, you know, allow the idea breathe, you know, let it have that year of kind of growing so that you know where you want to take it before jumping into the application. Thank you, Lisa. I'll pass it on. Uh, Jill, would you like to add something now? I just wanted to add something um, before if Fergus wanted to add anything to it, which is I'm just conscious that it's um, when you outline even the three different um, versions of the PhD scholarships that um, the IRC has at the moment and that when Fergus outlines how it works with him with the um, with uh, Project Arts Centre, it's just um, the current context, this was even true before the current context, but it's even more true now um, that cultural organisations often find it really challenging to, um, to, to release funding to support a PhD student. And if that was true before COVID, that's very powerfully true now. I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, when the performing arts have been so powerfully impacted and particularly dance and particularly theatre. Um, so, and so I, there was another thing that I wanted to kind of pick up from what Fergus was saying, which is around hacking. And I really liked the way you spoke about that. And I think that's something that as artists and people who've come from an arts practice background, um, that we have that ability to um, think creatively about structures that are there, that um, I, I hope is helpful. But I think in this kind of particular context, um, the only way that I could think contemporarily that um, either the enterprise or the or maybe possibly more the enterprise one, but certainly the employment based scheme would work was if it was somehow in an interdisciplinary context so that the arts practice was collaborating with an organization outside of arts practice. I'd love it for it to be within arts practice, but I'm just thinking economically how that would work. And it would be interesting to um, open the field for pe people um, how they thought about that. Um, Fergus, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, just to say practically, it wasn't that Project Arts Centre had money to be able to employ me. We worked together for me to be able to, in a way, to generate income through my other work so that then Project Arts Centre would be able to employ me. But it, like, it was different in the sense that the project did employ me. It, it has an obligation to provide a salary at a particular level, and then the IRC is providing part of that. Um, but 
but part of the hacking was how we would work together to do that. And it did, it did cost Project Mon uh, Art Centre money, um, but I helped, we worked together to make sure that it would be able to kind of pay me at the salary that it was supposed to. So I think there are ways, there are ways to be, um, yeah, just sort of intelligent about that. Um, and then the other thing, I just, a thought that occurred to me um, when Lisa was talking just about um, artistic practice and, uh, and, um, and kind of marinating, that it's also worth remembering that, you know, Lisa is already someone who has a long experience as, an, uh, as a performer and maker. So that kind of year of marinating is on top of a lot of stuff. And even though I didn't do a practice, um, a practice-based PhD, the reflection, you know, comes after having generated quite a body of artistic experience to draw on. Um, so, yeah, th there's something I think that's uh, different in that to the idea of just coming straight from your MA. I actually, I know you came straight from your MA as well, Lisa, but still with a long um, career um, as an artist. Um, and I think that, yeah, yeah this is a really good point in that because I, I, I think that actually you come with a, a bedrock of confidence in your area. Um, and I, I often wonder what this process will be like had I just, you know, come straight from a, a BA, an MA into a PhD because it does take a huge amount of confidence, firstly, to kind of envisage your project, sell it to everyone around you and then continue, you know, so have you almost, you know, I, I've done that a few times and successfully done it a few times, which has given me the confidence, to, you know, to maybe do it again. But I do often wonder about this process for somebody at the beginning. And I think it would need, as you say, champions to really you know, have your back really strongly, um, which I've had, absolutely have had. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm so impressed actually when I see people, you know, in their 20s doing this and I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'd like to pass on to um, Ivan. Um, so in terms of challenges for um, assessing creative practice output. There's actually a couple of questions in the Q&A that focus specifically on this. Um, so how, if you could tell us more about how creative practice outputs are assessed as opposed to published outputs, if you could say something about, are there any specialist artistic assessors as part of the assessment team or any tips you might have for applicants in terms of how they might present their work for assessment? I think these are kind of the struggles at the moment. Absolutely, no, happy to, happy to. And um, really some really interesting points were made by, by Lisa and Fergus, which really made me think. I think um, the impression I have of research in this area, artistic doctorates, is that these are complex projects in the sense that they are combining, as you all know, um, the, the written elements with also a very reflective, performative or practice-based element too. So it seems to me particularly Tying in, I think, with what Lisa just said, um, if somebody is coming to this type of research without a lot of experience, choosing a supervisor well is, would be very important, um, such that good advice, practical advice, can be forthcoming from the very start. Um, that said, I've certainly, just in, in preparing for this, I read through some um, applicants' assessments and the assessor forums and um, people who'd applied for artistic PhDs funded by us. And um, it was interesting how many of them had very rich backgrounds, which I think in all likelihood did enhance their applications, that they brought a wealth of experience, not necessarily just academic experience. And that certainly matters. And that is, I think, an opportunity really for a great many applicants. Um, and it's always worth as a tip, I think, when writing an application, look for the evaluation criteria check them out and see what, and look at the weightings as well. Um, because typically on our programs, the number one, the, the heaviest weighting if you want is the project. So it's basically having a good idea. So clearly Fergus and Lisa had the idea and that, that's really what is the, the primary thing that assessors are looking for. But almost as important as that is the applicant as well. 
And there is um, opportunity in the form, even though it is very generic, there's opportunity for the applicant to put in, um, to really to, to describe to the best potential they can their, what they're bringing to the project. So there's a personal statement, for example, um, opportunity to describe outputs, um, so that so basically the applicant can really show off everything that they're bringing to this project. So I think that is that is quite key. So having the support and then I suppose showing oneself off to best advantage. Um, something I've noticed in assessors forms, for example, is that they'll comment on what's not in the application sometimes because they can only assess what's there. So word counts are often an issue and I think that will be a challenge for people writing the applications to, to adhere to those word counts and as, as Lisa implied the system it's an, it's an online system it's, it's, it's tough in the sense that if you go a character over it's not going to let you submit so you have to stick within those, those word counts um, and then show craft your answers to the best ability of your ability to show exactly what you're bringing to the project and to show the, the quality of your, your ideas being those, those key points. Um, something else I would suggest as a tip as well is, um, I think in you were asking about the assessors. So we have a huge pool of assessors. Um, I just checked the other day with 4,000 currently assessing things for us. So we have a very large pool of assessors. So they would come with expertise in every area. Um, and if we don't have an expert in an area that a person applies in, we'll recruit a new expert. So a lot of the team's time is taken up with assigning assessors to applications and the, the pool is constantly being refreshed and they're all international, as I said earlier. Um, but I would advise applicants to help us in the sense that when you're applying, you fill in your primary area, your discipline. You can indicate if it's interdisciplinary, if there's a secondary area, keywords, so complete all of that as best you can, um, because that will help guide the IRC in assigning your assessor so that you're assessed by someone who is a really good match for your area. And obviously that's what everyone wants. You want to be judged by someone who really knows what you're trying to do. Um, so that's, that's a key one. And often that's necessary because the title alone very often doesn't convey the nature of the project. Like for example, I was, looking through past applications and um, sometimes the title might convey that it's an artistic doctorate. So those key words, all of those opportunities that are there, I think you use them, you absolutely make use of them because um, as was said earlier, these are quite generic questions given that people from all disciplines are applying. Um, so it's a case of kind of adapting them to the best you can to the research project that, that you have in mind. Um, I just noticed a, a question in the chat earlier as well. Somebody was asking about age, I think, and um, we accept applications from any age of person. So there's no age limit. And um, as I commented earlier, actually having a lot of experience and relevant experience that's really going to enhance your project, I think is a big bonus. So actually uh, don't be deterred by being older than what you might perceive as the norm. Thank you. Um, yes, there's some questions around the, this um, notion of age that you were talking about, because I think there's two types of applicants, um, younger students with just a couple of years of experience who are beginning their careers, and then uh, more mature students who already have a career and the background uh, to um, help to, to take them forward. So I guess one of the questions here, because um, we talked about how important it is to have um, champions to have a career and to have already built relationships. What about people who are at the earlier stages of their career that haven't yet filled that in? How might they, how might they put forward um, or yeah? <laughs> I don't know if anyone has any. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can have a go with that one. I'm happy to hear the other views too. Um, I think it's important to make use of whatever resources you can access. So if you're applying to for an IRC award, it's to be based at an Irish higher education institution. And those institutions all have research officers and research offices, um, some of which have quite large staff, some are smaller depending on the size of the institution, but they're, they're there, they're well equipped to advise you on your application. Um, so get advice from them 
They may or may not have helped people to apply for artistic doctorates, but they'll certainly have death, I think it's 100% likely they'll have helped people apply for IRC awards, at least in the past. They might be able to show you past applications. They'll certainly have seen these, these types of applications before. They can give you practical, solid advice. And then absolutely pick your supervisor wisely. So if you're coming to this, say straight from undergrad, for example, or straight from a, a 12 masters, I'd suggest definitely having a good supervisor um, who can give you advice, who has perhaps ideally supervised um, previous IRC awards or awards that funded similar types of research. People who know what they're doing, they, they've already done this. They can give you an awful lot of information, not just on how to apply, but actually how to do the research and then, um, and then how to basically achieve whatever you'd like to achieve at the end of it, whether it's an academic career or something different. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the panel who would like to mention anything? Zoo? Yes, I had a couple of questions coming out of the discussion so far. Um, one is, um, uh, I suppose it's a broad question, which is um, at the moment, artistic research doctorate applications to the IRC are in the same pool as any other forms of uh, form of doctorates, a more traditional kind of funded uh, document doctorate. Um, and you mentioned there that sometimes applicants don't clearly articulate that. Do you think there's any, um, there would be any interest or any, it would be useful um, for the kind of uh, research um, ecology of Ireland for there to be a distinct thread that was specifically for artistic research PhDs? Or do you feel that it works fine the way that it is? Um, so, yeah, I mean, personally, I think it would be fantastic. I'd love to see that happen. Um, I think, maybe just to clarify one point, um, thinking of, say, the Government of Ireland Postgrad Scholarship Scheme, which is the, the largest one that we found. Um, so its applications are split into two streams, one being arts, humanities and social sciences, the other being STEM. So actually, I probably should have said that earlier. So artistic doctorates are competing, if you wish, with all other AHSS applications, but they're not competing with STEM. That may give people some encouragement, at least, that they're not fighting off the STEM people. They're purely fighting off each other. It sounds like the Hunger Games, so I apologize for that. Um, but um, you were commenting on artistic doctorates and whether there'd be an interest in just funding them as a specific stream, for example. I think that would be really a really interesting initiative. I think the the challenge for the IRC is that I guess we don't know what the future holds as regards our own budget um, post COVID or maybe it's too soon to talk about post COVID during COVID. Um, our hope is that budget would remain static rather than decrease. An increase would be lovely, but um, I wouldn't hold too much hope right now, given the demands that are on the, the public purse in other areas. So it, the challenge then in, the, in times of a static budget is that every time you decide to put money into a specific area, you're taking money away from a general area. So I think if we were to have a specific strand, for example, of Government of Ireland postgrad, which was for artistic doctorates, it would need to be perhaps in partnership with another organization with match funding or perhaps something coming from the relevant department. But um, I, for me, just looking on as an outsider, I think a great advantage of the community that's behind artistic doctorates is that it seems very well networked, people seem very well um, familiar with one another. And I think there's the potential to be quite a strong voice in terms of what the community wants. And certainly in terms of getting anything from, from government or from different bodies, having one voice and having very clear asks um, is the only way to, to achieve success. So that's, I think, sound a little ambiguous, but I, my implication is really that right now I don't see, unless money were to come from somewhere, a specific strand, but I wouldn't say never if it were lobbied for and if perhaps some opportunity arose in partnership between organizations. Yeah. Thank you. I think, Lisa, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, no, just in relation to that, um, 
I just think the value of arts practice and using arts practice as a way of actually getting people to look around issues or to really consider deeply, it's, it's amazing. So, I mean, I live with a, a psychologist who, you know, he does lots of um, stuff psychology stuff um, <laughs> but it's it's based around interviewing it's based around you know gathering people's perspectives but what you know what you can do in arts practice is you can get people to make pieces of artwork and then use that as almost like the place to really um, investigate uh, any topic and then at the end of that then you can actually you know interview them then about what they then feel about an issue so you're not just sitting people down going so tell me what you think about autonomy you know you've had them think about this concept for like six weeks and then they get to speak about it and obviously they've had to wrestle through with other people they've had to wrestle with themselves and you know and I think the value of, of actually getting people to look at something creatively is massive. Um, and I think there's, there's definitely something for research, especially in this time of COVID, we're in a massively complex time of how we're organizing. And if we just go in and ask people's opinions, you just get opinions. But if you get people to wrestle with something through creation, it's, it actually has a huge value in getting people to consider things more deeply, I think. Thank you. Um, I would just like to, there's a couple of questions in terms of um, uh, younger candidates and older candidates. What about um, people who are currently changing careers at a later stage? Is the PhD a valuable experience in terms of moving from um, a singer job or a music um, in the field into a more pedagogic careers into third level institution. So would that be at the later stage in a career, would that be, would the PhD bring something of value? Lisa, Ivan, very good. Anyone would like to come? Do a PhD to get a job is a bad idea, personally. Uh, there's so few lectureships out there. Um, I initially started for that reason and then the everything, yeah, lots of things changed. Um, I'm so glad I did the PhD though. I left school early um, at the age of 16 to go to ballet school, which at the time seemed like a great idea. Um, and, but now like having actually done it, I did it for different reasons to that because I think we're in, you know, there's no way of predicting anything, but if you want to do a PhD, do it for your, for the reasons that you are massively interested in your topic. Um, I just think it's a dangerous kind of precedent to think that there's a job at the end of it. I mean, there has been a job at the end of it for me. You know, I, I started on Monday, but I think I wasn't employed on the basis of having my PhD. I was employed on the basis of having other things as well. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's something it, you have to do it for the love of it. I mean, I've definitely finished in a pandemic for the love of it. Um, and other than that, you, it's very hard to make it through, I imagine. Thank you. And uh, Ivan, could you tell us more about um, whether there has been many successful um, employment and enterprise scheme applications, specifically in the area of artistic research? So what has been happening in terms of uh, these two strands of funding in artistic research? There's something you might want to share with us. Sure, yeah. I guess one difficulty we have is actually picking out the artistic doctorates from the more traditional type because we don't actually have a question that applicants flag that this is what it is. And um, so uh, one would need to delve more into the project descriptions to find out. So actually identifying projects that would be deemed artistic isn't immediately obvious or easy. So I, I I confess I was surprised because I didn't think we funded that many, but then when I started to dig in, I found more and more, um, which were covering music, theatre, dance, um, creative writing, um, but this is speaking across our, our different postgraduate schemes. I think there is definitely scope on our enterprise suite programmes, so the EPS and the EPP, there's definitely scope for more partnerships with cultural organisations. There hasn't been a lot to date, and I think there's definitely scope for more. But I think the point that um, might have been Jules who made it, I forget now, but that there is, of course, the financial aspect, which is, of course, a challenge for cultural organizations, um, none of which are tremendously wealthy. So just to point out, I suppose, that um, 
there is a huge, if there is the funding available in the cultural organization, there is a huge advantage, I think, to supporting an EPS or EPP scholar because of the, the work that that individual is doing, it being ideally very relevant to the interests of the organization. And essentially it does benefit them working with the researcher. Um, but also just to point out, um, in the last couple of years on the Enterprise Partnership Scheme, we have offered a waiver for the first year of the contribution from the partner. So we'd hope to continue that subject to having the budget. So essentially, if a partner were to um, have a successful, say, EPS application, which is a four-year PhD, they wouldn't have to contribute anything in the first year. They just do years two, three, and four, for example. So we'd like to continue that, um, recognizing that employers and enterprise partners of all kinds are, are having a difficult time at present. So I think that would be valuable. Um, and I think as, as Fergus commented, um, these schemes are particularly valuable at times like this when, when we're all operating under straightened circumstances. So um, that goes probably for all three, all three programs, but more particularly for the ones in partnership, um, that it does give people the opportunity to do something very worthwhile that will give them great skills, extensive knowledge in, a, in their chosen area, um, and that will be a benefit to them whatever their career leads them to. I think as Lisa said, yeah, it's definitely not to something that's going to lead you to X job the next day. It's not, it's not the way it works, unfortunately. But I do think it's never to be underestimated the huge amount of learning and personal growth and development that a person who has one of these awards or even just does the artistic doctorate unfunded, the amount that they achieve. And that certainly makes them a better employee or worker of any kind, whatever their life leads them to. Thank you. And I think, Fergus, you would like to add something to the discussion. Um, or maybe just picking up then, I absolutely agree. And, and I, I see some people have responded this in the same way with Lisa that um, it, it's interesting, even just from a kind of conceptual point of view, um, I, my sense is uh, being with students who are entirely intent on academic careers, um, it focuses your research in a particular way because you've got to be strategic about what you, your outputs, who you associate with. So it actually puts a kind of constraint on the way that you do your research if what you're doing is positioning yourself for academic advancement. And, and people do that and it's entirely legitimate, but there are that, I don't think that that is necessarily the most comfortable or the most, uh, open way to approach a research. I think you just absolutely have to be committed uh, to the idea and uh, because this is about a set of relationships that you're going to undertake for three or four years at least, if not longer. Um, so are you going to be happy being in those relationships with that information, with those topics, with that research area, um, with yourself in the middle of all of that? So, you know, you have to be sure that that's, that that's um, going to be comfortable. I wanted to go back and it's going to be a little bit, um, um, in a way might be controversial in the sense that, um, going back to the idea of whether there should be separately funded um, uh, artistic PhDs, um, I made a very clear choice not to do a practice-based PhD partly because I didn't want to give my work to the academy because I, I didn't think that my artistic practice was uh, something that the academy could be judging. So it was more about put, assessing my work in context and actually doing that in a different discipline like geography could absolutely provide me with the tools and the reflective frameworks to do that. So that was very important. But it was also strategic in the sense that I didn't want to be in an artistic ghetto. I wanted to show that I could show up as a legitimate um, uh, academic geographer and therefore that my artistic knowledge could then influence that environment, but having received, have kind of absolutely having proven its credentials already. And so for me, it's interesting to know that there are artistic practice, and I, you know, I agree with Lisa as well, artistic practice can achieve these things in a way that, that other research methods can't, um, but that they are able to show up through an assessment process legitimately 
Um, and alongside, you know, other not artistic based, uh, artistic based projects and still, you know, and still survive and still win and still contribute in the way that Lisa does. So, um, and no one can question the validity of those, um, those interventions in the academy because they've been through the same, same assessment process as everything else. So I just have a small kind of reserve and wonder about being ghettoized because we often are in the arts. So, and, and we know the research, we know, you know, when you look at the, um, the research on arts-based practice or, or the literature on, even on author ethnography, there's often a sniffiness around it being um, not legitimate uh, research. So I don't want to let us and the knowledge that we as artists have, or that indeed that creative practice can bring, be ghettoized in that way. So that's my just caveat. <laughs> that's a really good point because I think, you know, by getting IRC funding in that forum, you've kind of in some level proven your artist, your, your, your academic chops as well. So there is another thing in that and, and you're having to compete in that forum. I'm, I'm glad to know STEM wasn't part. I didn't actually know. I thought I was competing against people who were curing cancer and I'm here going, I think we should think about autonomy. Um, but you know, I think it's, I think it is, it does give your research a bit more backup, you know? Okay. Thank you so much. I'm just conscious we've gone a couple of minutes over, but um, it's been a really lively session and I really appreciate your perspective. Um, Fergus, we had a, um, we've discussed some of these issues before just kind of privately and I think it's really great to have this kind of broad range of perspectives. Um, I think it's really interesting because this whole research project is focused on how do we form a hybrid space and how do we value that? Um, and we can go on and, um, and continue this discussion. So um, I just want to thank you heartily, um, Evan O'Brien, um, Fergus Okahor and Lisa McLaughlin and Inis Bento Coelho and behind the scenes, Michael Ryan. Um, thank you all. Um, on Tuesday next week, we have uh, our seminar on um, PhD examination. And then on Thursday, it's our first session um, with PhD students contributing. So do join us for both of those. And uh, so we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you all. Bye bye.